This is the Free Heal Life Podcast, episode number 164. I'm your host, Josh Madsen, coming at you from the Free Heal Life shop in Salt Lake City, Utah. And happy Monday, my friends and family out there in Telemark world. Stoked to be back. And uh, winter's really uh, on the move here in Utah. I know uh, people out there are having other, other situations, but... Uh, I will say a lot of times that happens to us in Utah too. Everyone else is getting smashed and getting good snow and we'll have kind of a a dry spell year. So I know we're getting it and it's looking pretty good here, but uh, there's still time. It's only January and I'm sure there's plenty of time to get some snow where you're at and uh, it's good to be in the, in the swing of things and knowing that everybody's out there having some fun. So hopping right into the newsroom and notes for the week, boots are uh, the common topic every week, it seems like this year. Uh, You know, we're really stocked up finally in the retail shop with boots and bindings for the most part. That first batch of airlifted boots uh, landed, came in the shop, and most of them went bye-bye. So we are ordering more boots in as needed and are willing to do that. Um, a lot of times shops aren't willing to take a lot of stuff in after January. Uh, we are kind of playing it by ear, but I know we just put in, uh, a purchase order for some more boots and kind of lining them up with people as we are doing that. And we've got a great relationship with Scarpa and Boulder and, uh, usually can get these orders put together and get them to Salt Lake or wherever, they need to go. So just a heads up on that. Like I keep saying over and over again, reach out to customer service at freehealthlife.com if you're in need of Scarpa Telemark boots, and we will happily do our best to get them. Some stuff is not in country any longer, as far as we can tell, certain sizes, certain models. So it's best just to reach out to us and, uh, you know, we'll do our best to direct you to where to find them if, 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 they're not here, you know, and I think that's the biggest challenge is, um, you know, we want to be able to help people get boots obviously through us so we can service you as a customer better, but ultimately we want you to get on your telemark equipment and get out there and do the things you want to do. So we'll do our best to, to guide you and give you the information that we have, uh, most up-to-date information that we have about what's going on. So kind of moving on to other things in the shop. One thing with all the supply chain challenges challenges this year was demos and rentals. Uh, difficult to get out because when we had one thing, we didn't have the other. And we finally, finally kind of have all the pieces of the puzzle to put together. So if you're needing to rent before you buy or maybe you're coming into town and you re- need rentals, there's still, uh, I guess... Uh, one more holiday sort of weekend, but you know, a lot of people travel to Salt Lake and sometimes just want to bring their boots. Um, we do have NTN setups and we are happy to get people out on those. Uh, we're slowly chipping away at that. We've got Vole skis with outlaws. I believe we've got some majos. We're going to be mounting up some protectors as well, both in the 95 and the 105 models and want to pe- get people on those as well. Uh, we won't be making any significant changes, probably just graphic changes going into next year. Um, I'm not even totally sure on that. So, uh, but I do want to kind of bring that up that as we're growing with getting our protector skis out there, we definitely want to give people the opportunity that are local or can access trying the skis uh, to do so. Uh, we've had so much great support over the last two seasons of our small batches of people purchasing uh, and not even having the opportunity to ski them. And we're so uh, grateful for that because, I mean, what a great way for us to be able to grow our business and what we're doing. And you trust us. And that's a big thing. Uh, and if you're interested in protector skis specifically, if you go to the products, even though they're sold out on freeheallife.com, there are some great reviews of the 95 and the 105. And I anticipate more reviews from current customers. Uh, that's a great place to read what uh, people are saying about the skis, what they do, 
Uh, I know some people include their height, weight, ski ability, that type of thing. And that's super, super helpful uh, for those that may be interested in getting a pair in the future. So uh, guess what time it is? It's January, which means this is when we start hearing about telemark gatherings, events, meetups, all that good stuff. And uh, I'm happy to put them out there. Uh, especially those people that we're, we're involved with, you know, maybe we're sending them some swag bags for their raffles or whatnot. Uh, we love getting involved as a brand with community building out there, wherever it may be. Uh, we try to do our best. I mean, obviously, uh, there's some costs associated with that, but we try to do our best at least to get out there. Uh, people that support us, we want to support them back. So the, the first one that's coming up real soon is Saturday, January 21st, starting bright and early in the morning. It says 7 a.m. on their uh, Facebook event, but I'm sure, you know, whatever time that that mountain opens. And it is at Caberfe Peaks in Michigan, the Lower Peninsula Pinhead Reunion of 2023. There's an awesome group down there, kind of in that uh, Grand Rapids zone. If you know Michigan, I'm sure everyone, well, Maybe if you're not from Michigan, you don't know to put your hand up like a mitten and show people where you live, but that's always my favorite part of the Michiganders showing me what part of the state they're from. It is a large state. So this is sort of that Southeast zone. Uh, I know uh, one of our buddies from uh, Kalamazoo is going to be there repping a new pair of protectors on his feet. And we're super stoked about that. Uh, and we've sent some uh, product out there for that event. Uh, following that one, staying in the Midwest, February 10th through the 12th, we've got Midwest Telefest all the way up in the UP of Michigan. So if you haven't been up there, Keith Opperman, uh, who's been uh, our Free Hill Life representative in that zone, he's uh, from Wisconsin, but that's such a great time to see hundreds of telemark skiers sort of drive all the way up to the upper peninsula of Michigan, way up in the Porcupine State Park, just outside of Ontonagon and Silver City. And uh, it's an amazing time, great skiing. We've had great snow the years that we've gone out there. And it's just a fun time hanging out with a bunch of teleheads, you know, cruising around. They've got the Smelly Knee Pad GS race, which is kind of a modified retro race uh, based on the Smelly Knee Pad that we do here in Utah at the end of every season. And it's just a grand old time. So be sure to check that out. I know they have a Facebook event as well. Uh, if you need more information, maybe you're not on Facebook, uh, you can hit me up at podcast at freehilllife.com and I can try to shoot you the info uh, about what is going on with these events to the best of my knowledge, which is basically what I'm telling you here. But either way, we can get you the info. Uh, next up in February that I'm aware of is the 36th annual Corey Anderson Telemark Festival in Bromley, Vermont. Uh, yeah, Feb 26th through the 27th. Bromley, always a stronghold in Vermont uh, for events. And uh, Greg Paquin, he was on the podcast. Uh, you can go check that out to learn a little bit more about that. And Corey Anderson, who is no longer with us, who started the festival many years ago, uh, helped a lot of people get into Telemark, started this festival 36 years ago, and the tradition lives on. And that's what I love to see is the next generation of people uh, carrying on great things like these festivals. And uh, Bromley's just been one of those spots with uh, Greg's been doing a bunch of instructing over the years. I believe they've had a kid's program. They've got a rental fleet, if I remember right from that conversation. Just an awesome spot to go uh, if you're in New England and want to meet some other telemarkers. You can check all the details out for that Corey Anderson. Corey is C A. R E Anderson Telemark Festival on Bromley's website and uh, definitely check that out. And then uh, getting it on the radar, I started mentioning World Telemark Day 2023. It's on March 4th, always the first Saturday in March every single year. 
and I will be releasing the press release and the logo this week. So definitely keep an eye on the website, freehealthlife.com, all of our social media, and we're going to be pumping that up. What you can do out there as a listener, as a free heal lifer, as a telemark skier is start getting a gathering place together. Even if you don't want to hang out with somebody and you know you're going to be in a zone, uh, you know, maybe let me know where you're at, you know, <laughs> just let me, let me know. But especially the people that are going to have a meetup somewhere, shoot me a message real quick, podcast at freehealthlife.com. Give me the time and the location, send location, and I will uh, put it out there. So maybe other people that listen to the podcast may travel over to that hill for the day and, uh, If you're a resort listening to this and you're a marketing person and you want an easy kill for the marketing calendar, uh, hit me up. I'll get you the press release and the logo and you can put something together and you'll have plenty of support across our social media and websites. And that's what it's all about. Uh, Same thing for shops. Uh, Great opportunity for other retail shops that do telemark equipment. Uh, maybe you want to have a little gathering and, and you can combine it. The goal is to get everyone out telemark skiing in the Northern hemisphere on the same day, March 4th world telemark day. It's going down. We're going to be up at Alta with our crew and, uh, we'll be having more, uh, addition. We'll have additional details regarding that as the, uh, the month goes by. So we'll make sure to keep you in the loop with that, but it is a time to celebrate. Uh, if you have an event that you want me to get out on the radar, uh, this, uh, in the podcast in the coming weeks, shoot me a message at podcast at freehealthlife.com with the info. And, uh, if nothing else, I'm happy, happy, happy to talk about it. What's going on and make sure that people in your location know about it. And that's been the cool thing about the podcast is as more and more people are finding it, it's, uh, it's, it's a nice way to give a weekly dose of what's going on in your zone. And if there's one thing I've learned over the many, many years of doing this, a couple decades, is people are willing to travel. They want to go to new places and they're down to meet new telemark skiers. And it's a pretty safe bet. They're going to be a cool crew of people. So that's kind of how uh, we like to roll. So let's keep them coming in. So today, my guest is originally from Menden, Utah, a small town in Cache Valley near Logan, Utah. She grew up always having cross-country skis around her house and was encouraged by her parents to get out and explore in the snow. Her first experience with making a telemark turn was in high school, but it wasn't until after she stopped playing collegiate sports and moved back to Utah in the mid-1990s that she jumped into making drop-knee turns full-time. During the late 90s, she would be exposed to telemark racing as well as the burgeoning telemark free ski scene. After spending a short time on the U.S. national telemark race team, she shifted focus over to telemark free ski competitions exclusively with great success. That's where she caught the eye of Josh Bones Murphy, who asked her to film for his third installment of the Unparalleled Telemark movie series, Unparalleled 3 Soul Slide. Her career skyrocketed quickly from there, locking down contracts with Nike ACG, Rosignol Telemark, and others. She continued with more podium finishes in the Telemark Big Mountain competitions, as well as landing on the big screen of Warren Miller's 54th movie, Journey, in 2003. She's one of my great friends in Telemark and an amazing freehill skier. So please welcome to the podcast, Sarah Clemenson. All right, Sarah, welcome to the Free Heal Life podcast. How you doing? Doing well. Thank you for having me, Josh. I am so stoked. This has been one on my (laughs) list since day one of uh, (laughs) finding all the the old friends and and, uh, getting your story on tape. So I'm I'm excited to have you here. I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled. (laughs) Well, we got got to catch up at, at... free heal life the other day which was really cool and um so magical oh it was awesome no i was so i was so stoked to have you i can't believe how much time's gone by because it's like you get together with someone you haven't seen in a really long time and you you know a lot of times i don't realize how 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 many years have gone by so (laughs) 
It's like another lifetime. <laughs> well, you look the same. <laughs> well, so you do too. You do too. It's all the good telemarketing, right? Yeah, exactly. And just what you've done and, and what you've accomplished is extremely impressive. So it was really fun to see. Well, I appreciate it. I was, uh, I know I was trying to drag you in and, and blame you because honestly, <laughs> we can, we can get into it a little bit, but I mean, the tr- truly let it be known that if it wasn't for meeting you, it's highly unlikely we would be having this conversation because, uh, you sort of introduced me to the whole world of sponsored athletes and taking photos and, and, and we'll get into that. But, uh, yeah, thank, thank you for that little, uh, uh, I don't know all the little invites along the way, because I don't think I'd, I, I don't think I would have gone the same direction. So it's pretty cool. Well, you're an absolute blast and it was destiny at, you know, <laughs> little beaver mountain. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Well, I want to, I want to talk, let's start there because you're, this is kind of where we met and, um, I want to talk a little bit about where you're from and where you grew up and, and all that good stuff. So get, lead, lead, lead us into it. Where, where are you from originally? So I'm from Menden, Utah, which is a small town up in Cache Valley. Um, most people maybe know about USU, um, Utah State University. And, you know, my local ski mountain was Beaver Mountain. My dad was a volunteer ski patroller there um, since I was, you know, little. And that's where our family would go to get our ski fix. <laughs> I love. It. I didn't know your dad was a ski patroller. That was he, he was. What, yeah. Was he a ski patroller when we met? Still, or was that like earlier on? That was earlier on, and he mainly did it so we could all have a pass. You yeah. know, it's expensive. There was five of us kids. My brother came a little later when I was ten, so things were different by then. So you know, I come from a family of six, and um, my dad actually was on the pro patrol in Crested Butte in the sixties. No way. I did not know that either. Okay. Yeah. That's- but came from Southern California. Him and my mom met at St. Clemente. He was a lifeguard there. So he's kind of always been in that scene. And then they were looking for inexpensive land with spectacular snow and, you know, a little ski resort nearby. And they found all that in Cache Valley. Wow. Really? Okay. Yeah. So... so- your dad was like more a waterman kind of growing up and then like beach and stuff like that. And then they just decided to move to cash Valley of all places. Yes. I mean, they did spend some ski family ski trips. Both my mom and dad, um, learned to ski, you know, at big bear. Um, my dad was San Bernardino, then coastal and then Alaska. I mean, they, they're, they're pioneers all over the place. He actually, was on a fire crew up in Alaska, worked on the pipeline. Like their story is impressive. And so that's kind of the the seed of, you know, the direction I took with my life. Wow. That's crazy. Okay. I didn't even know that part. That's awesome. Um, yeah. It, yeah. Especially knowing your dad. I don't know if I really got to, to know your mom that well, but your, your dad is a big dude. I mean, like, <laughs> like, like a specimen of a, of a man. I mean, like very strong and, um, athletic. I mean, obviously you got all of these traits because watching you ski early on when I met you, I was like, where, where is she from? I'm like, <laughs> you just, you're shredding. I, I I was like, I don't think my legs can keep up with this girl. So, <laughs> oh, I'm kind of, <laughs> I felt the way that way about you. But no, my my parents are both athletes. My dad was um full scholarship for water polo, and my mom was actually in surf movies, which I think kind of sparked my interest in a lot of this, which is interesting. And they um have these old wooden skis still at their house. Uh, those are the only things I want when they pass on to the other world. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> that was the first telemark turn that I took was on some wooden Bona skis um, with my biology teacher up somewhere around Beaver. Like you got extra credit if you could make a telly turn. And this was probably my junior year in high school. And I loved his class so much that I, went and spoke to my counselors and asked if I could um, have them 
waive an extra chemistry course and switch it for biology. That is so they you. Did. That's so <laughs> you. You're like wheeling and dealing the teachers for <laughs> extra ski time. <laughs> and of course they said yes, All right? All did was field trips, field trips. Oh my yes. gosh, that's amazing. Well, and it, yeah. d- describe for, for those, I don't know if I've... T- I might have mentioned Beaver on here a couple of times, but describe Beaver Mountain to people because so like Cache Valley, she, you know, she, you said you grew up in Menden. So Logan's kind of like the main, the main town there, but describe Beaver Mountain for people because it really isn't much different probably from when you were growing up. Um, and, and it's pretty unique. Yes, it is. I mean, they added one lift, right? Since, <laughs> mm-hmm. but um, the beginner hill is, not much of a beginner hill. Um, it's a pretty sweet mountain. Um, family owned, mop pop resort, old lifts that you, you're surprised you survived and no one fell off. I don't think they've had any casualties at least <laughs> publicized. <laughs> but just like such a fun, I mean, I remember my mom making a huge crock pot full of chili. They had Monday night, family nights night skiing and cornbread and we'd go hang out in the the ski patrol lodge where i first met you that was the ski patrol lodge and uh you know just all these families that were into skiing and the experience and the snow and just the the environment we'd go up and just you know shred little beef just for hours just making you know (laughs) run after run after run but um there's four lifts now it used to be three lifts and they don't always operate the face which we called the face which was like the extreme part of the mountain <laughs> <laughs> and then there's also the back side which is um a whole other realm and and it was ted and marge who still own and um ted has passed on but marge is still up there and it's just so fun to see her smiling face when i go in and our family actually has booked a we have like a tradition where we go up there and stay at the year. It kind of got shut down during COVID and stuff, but we're so excited because they opened it up again and we're all meeting up there. Um, I think here in February for a couple nights of family ski fun and sleeping over in the yurt. Oh, that's amazing. I mean, that, that is like, like my memories of, of, working up there and skiing it's just you know though though because of having been there i think i really gained an appreciation for like you said that mom and pop resort i mean i'll never forget realizing that marge who was the owner was like Mm -hmm. who you got your lift ticket from you know (laughs) like to to today as well she's still in there is she still in the ticket office (laughs) that's amazing yes I mean, it's, yeah. it's just, it, it's like going back in time and I love the crock pot thing too, that you said, because it is, it's like a true, you know, uh, you're not there for like crazy amenities or some resort or anything like that. I mean, there's, there's like the cafeteria, the little shop downstairs, um, you know, and it's like you bring your lunch or maybe you buy a burger and fries. It's like nothing fancy, but you're there for the skiing and then there's, kind of all your uh your favorite spots like you mentioned the backside i remember that being like the big deal when i got there you know it's like are you skiing (laughs) are you skiing the backside today and it's like you know early 2000s it's like if you skied the backside like you were you know you were at a level you know because you're you're skiing down to the road and and then you're having to hitchhike back up you know to the (laughs) to the resort you know (laughs) it's an adventure and it's cute josh like i have um you know, a lot of people I grew up with and and they have kids now and I just saw um, close friends post and all her boys are just launching the mile high cliff back there because they just had, I think um, it was my niece's birthday and they just Beaver Mountain received 10 inches of snow, which is like, whoa. Yep. <laughs> so it was just fun to see, you know, people just still super passionate about it through generation after generation. Yeah, I love that. Um, okay. Take me back to these bonus skis. So you, you end up on these bonus skis and so did you guys cross country ski or were uh, you said, were were one of your parents a telemark skier? How did that all come about? Yeah. So I grew up on telemark or on, um, cross country skis, like my backyard, you open up the sliding glass door and my mom would 
we all had, you know, various, we had a, a whole um, slew of cross country skis. And that was one of the activities we would do. We would go sledding or cross country ski. And I remember just, you know, exploring with my little sister, we'd just head out the side door and head up into the mountains and be gone for hours. And my mom would usually say, yeah, don't come home until your cheeks are rosy. Oh, really? <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and so that's kind of, I think, where I, I gained my balance for sure. And just the, the whole movement of sliding. I, I never had any sort of lesson. But, yeah, just cross-country skiing is um, something that I've always enjoyed. And then my dad telemark skied in Crested Butte. He was one of the only telemark skiers at Crested Butte. And you, you and I both know, I think anyone listening to this, Crested Butte is a pretty spectacular mountain. It's um, definitely um, intimidating. And, I mean, the stories that they have of Crested Butte it's impressive. So, you know, from a young age, I'm always, you know, I, I, I skied through school, but I didn't, you know, we'd go up on weekends here and there. And then, you know, as I grew up in middle school, I was involved with other sports and stuff. So I didn't really ski as much until I, um, and that's a whole other story, but until um, things went a different direction in college. But initially, you know, I wanted to try and telemark ski and, you know, got the extra credit for the one turn <laughs> with Dr. <laughs> or with Bosworth and then um, ended up, I had a full ride scholarship to Portland State, went up to Portland, took a different direction, came back to Utah and ended up going up to Deer Valley and taking those wooden bonus skis. Um, there was a crew like that's where I met Noah and um, a few other people no, and a Noah, lot of the Noah Howell. Noah Howell is wow. where I met him when I was like 19 up at, at uh, Deer Valley. He was my foreman. And his whole goal up there was we ski. This is, that's what we do. Like you're here to work, you're getting paid. But he just had a system where we would take laps. Like I felt like I skied. I didn't feel like I worked. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, so we had a blast, but they all were on tellies and I had like these old, you know, all my gear was hand me down. I, I never had new gear and, um, they all tell you. And I'm like, I really want to tell you my sister had a pair. And, um, so I tried them out and then I had to give them back. And, and I remember asking my parents if I could borrow their wooden bonus. And they said, yes, and literally leather boots and ankle high <laughs> and i went i skied um well, i'm trying to remember the run but it was up at silver lake and i remember coming down and linking turns and then i got to the bottom and some guy wanted to buy them off of me oh my god <laughs> but <I'm> like, seriously <laughs> yeah but i'm like i definitely need to get a pair so you know and i just threw myself into bumps i'm like if i'm gonna learn this like it, it was like an addiction i fell so in love with it that it just the fluidity, the the movement, the um, everything about it was captivating to me. And you know, like you know, you find something you love. That's all you want to do. That's awesome. So that, that so that was like late. Okay, that kind of fills in the gap. I for, I totally forgot you met Noah at. at uh, um, and for those of you that don't know who Noah Howell is, that's uh, later later he becomes one of the founders of the Powder Horror guys or a group movie company so um but yes. uh that's so funny um uh, so was that like late late 90s like 1999 ish somewhere in there so this is this is 96 97 that's that winter season um you know i i and it was more like kind of a connection to a connection and, and taking a different path from my scholarship because i volleyball was my passion at the time and i things went awry there. So I, I, you know, my next passion became skiing and that following season I moved to Bozeman. So 98, 99, I was in Bozeman and I worked in Alaska during the summer. Um, and in Bozeman, that's all I did. I saved up enough money to where I could just ski every day. That's how hooked I was. And then decided I wanted to go back to school. So then that's when I came back down to Utah and 
met you up at Beaver. Yeah. Okay. That that kind of fills it in because so yeah because I I do remember that you I mean you were like super high level volleyball. Obviously, you got a full ride scholarship to a university to play. Um, <laughs> I guess I didn't really realize though, like it, it wasn't like you were a skiing, well, you know, like some people, you know, you grew up skiing around skiing, you got cross country skis, but it wasn't like you were, you were focused on another sport primarily, right? Like you actually, weren't... yeah. Yeah. Like three sports. So I, uh, volleyball was my number one and I played that year round. And then I also was on the swim team. We, um, our relay team placed in the top three at state, almost every year i mean we were we were competitive mountain crest was super competitive and then i also track and field was my other passion like i was a heptathlete um and my main events were hurdles high jump long jump but so it's kind of hard to pick and choose but um i would say volleyball was first and then track and field would have been second my second choice but I ended up pursuing volleyball, moved to Hawaii to kind of, pers- I wanted to be a pro beach volleyball player, then came back to Utah. And then just the snow has just always like, I have to have snow. I love the ocean too, but I, <laughs> you know, I got hooked into skiing. That's funny. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's cool because I move. I end up moving up to, to Logan in, in 2000, which is where we bump into each other. And, and I was kind of the same way. I mean, skiing was always a part of my life, but you know, I like same thing. I was playing sports in high school and you know, I was skiing on, you know, very similar, you know, it's like you're, you know, I worked at Brighton to get a pass, but um, yeah. it wasn't like, it, and, and honestly, that's what led me to Beaver. Cause I was like, well, how am I going to get a season pass? Oh, I'm going to, um, I, uh, I had, been like a peer sort of apprentice instructor at Brighton. So I was like, Oh, I'm moving to Logan. I'll go to this little resort. And, and I, uh, we were talking about this the other day, but I, I remember I got up there and I'm like, you know, I'm going to go up and ask them if they need a telemark ski instructor, you know, like I'm thinking, okay, this is, here's my end. There can't possibly be anybody (laughs) that's going to be a telemark ski instructor at Beaver mountain up here in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, (laughs) I'll never forget meeting you because this is, so this is 2000, winter 2000, or was it? Yeah, it would have been winter 2000. It was, yeah, because I was Bozeman 98, 99, and that's when I came back is winter 2000, 2001. Yep. Right. Yeah, totally. Yep. Yeah. And I remember cause I'm sitting in what you were calling it was, I think it was the old patrol shack, but it had become like the, uh, the ski, ski school. Instructor. Yeah. The ski yeah. school. I mean, we're talking like, a teeny teeny room like next to the ticket office so i mean it was like yeah. we're all packed in there and uh it was like an orientation day or something and this is this is how i remember it is and i was telling you this the other day because i always i have this distinct memory of you walking like across the snow outside this shack and i look out you've got this matching outfit on it's kind of this baby blue J- jacket with a bunch of patches on it and like a baby blue matching pants with like stripes down the side and right and i'm like and someone's like i'm like who's that and she's it's like oh that's sarah clements and she's uh she's gonna be a telemark instructor and i was like what i was like <laughs> Like I was so confused, you know, and then, you know, we end up talking and I'm like, what is this out? Like, what are all these patches on your jacket? And you're like, I'm on the U S national telemark race team. And I was like, what is that? Like, I have no idea that there's even racing, uh, it, it, like a high level like that. <laughs> so, okay. So where did that all happen? Because, you know, like the, that was my introduction to you. Like not as a free skier. I don't even know if we had that term back then, but, um, I, I just thought you were like this racer person, you know? So like, where did, did that happen in Bozeman? Yeah. Yeah. No, walk us through. Well, no, like I've never raced in my life. Like I'm not a racer growing up in Utah. I I don't know. Unless you're, you know, I don't know. I I didn't really know how to carve. Like I know how to ski powder and stuff. (laughs) (laughs) I, I ran into this girl. I saw her, same thing. She had this jacket on up in Bozeman. And I 
I was diehard up there. Like, that's all I did. I didn't have a job, nothing. Every morning, woke up, you know, disciplined. You're very disciplined as well. I remember meeting you, and that's one of the things that attracted me to you and your, your just your discipline. You want something, you achieve it. And so I saw this girl, Dana Greenberg. She's um, she's racer, East Coast, um, Massachusetts, and she had this Telmark jacket on. And I was like, huh so i went up and i approached her asked her and she's like why don't you come and come to one race and and see if you like it and so we did and um it wasn't and you you entered the circuit so you kind of <laughs> saw the um the team and you know one of my dreams as a little girl was to to be in the olympics and i'm like this might be the ticket <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and I know Telemark has been trying for years to get into the Olympics and it's still not an Olympic event, which shocks me. But, um, um, I mean, obviously I had fun. Like the Telemark races are totally different than, you know, any other ski race. They have the Rapalusha, the jumps. They're just, they're more involved. You have to skate ski. I mean, you remember, but, um, so I went to a race and I don't even know how, cause so I had started telemark skiing at the tail end of deer valley after meeting Noah and all those guys and then went up to bozeman and that's all i did that whole season met her towards the tail end of the season or probably middle season because we did go to one competition together the brighton free ski comp and then we went to a tele race i think i can't remember the resort it, it was um somewhere in washington Oh, it's probably, it was probably of, Crystal Mountain. Yeah, well, we, we met a lot of great people, and I basically made the team. Because they Just in a single year. <laughs> Not even a full season. Oh, my God. <laughs> Which I'm like, they give me an outfit. They give me ski boots. You know, I'm like, yes, please. Um, I think I got skis, and so that's how that kind of unfolded. And then um, I think when we went to Brighton, I can't remember. I, I know I always just pushed it so hard. Sometimes I forget which ones I won or didn't win because um, sometimes I would crash. You know, and if you crash, you don't win. But they're like, what? This girl's throwing like tricks, well, not tricks, but like throwing herself off of cliffs because <laughs> most women kind of just would ski. I remember meeting Leslie Ross, who is a ripping skier. A lot of these women, you know, that we ran into who did the comps and um, just more, it was just fun, you know, um, and then just all the people that we met along the way, it was just a lot of fun people and that's kind of how it all unfolded. I didn't, I, that's, that's so cool. Cause I didn't realize, so you went to the Brighton comp probably in, was that 99 or was that 2000? It was 99. I think it was 99, 2000. So it must've been that, that spring. I forget when it was, but I think I got like I can't remember who won, but I think I got like second place, maybe. Yeah. Okay. This kind of, you know, became known like in the industry. Yeah, no, for sure. That was actually a pretty important comp that I haven't dug. Part of why I was so excited to get you on here is you're one of the first, I have talked to Ben Dolans, but I, uh, Love Ben. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. There, but I haven't. I've kind of started digging in. I guess I did talk to Nat Ross, but I'm that kind of section between two, th like late '90s to sort of like 2010. I haven't. I haven't dug in there a ton, but that Brighton comp always comes up um, in '99. It's sort of like a real um, kind of pivotal point, I think, for some of that because it ended up and I don't think the I think Jeff Wright started the USTSA thing I think just a little bit after that um, but Brighton I mean it had all those people that were coming from uh, from Colorado like Summit County so you had like Dolans you had uh, Ross Richards you had um, BJ Brewer Molly Duma um, Yes. Nat Ross, uh, Leslie, Leslie Ross. Leslie Ross, yeah. I mean, there was a lot of people, and, and it was one of the few comps. There might have been one or two more at Brighton after, but then there was no U Utah comps after that. And so, yeah. 
Yeah, no, that's okay. So, wow, you kind of, so you, <laughs> so 96, 97, you start telemarking and by like 99, you're doing big mountain comps and, and you're on the U.S. telemark team. That's yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just got like hooked, like, you know, found something that I was so passionate about and it consumed me. Yeah, no, for sure. Well, and th- that's kind of like when you and I uh, met, I, I kind of, that's funny that how you met, um, what was her name up in Bozeman that you saw her? Dana, Dana, Dana Greenberg. Yeah. yeah. So I, yeah, you see her and it was kind of the same thing with me. I was totally unaware of this like race thing and I didn't know anything about the free ski stuff happening. And when I see your jacket, I'm like, what is this? And then I, I'm sure you probably told me that you're probably like, yeah, I got a pair of boots and a pair of skis and or whatever. <laughs> and I'm like, what? I'm like, how do you do that? You know? So you and I kind of ended up, sort of teaming up like you're like totally. you, you should come to a race and i was like oh okay and i'll uh i'll never i'm trying to you even, became my training partner oh yeah i remember you and i would simultaneously ski down was it lose or one of the direct runs off of um beaver and we'd look over at each other and i mean we're burning and we're going through moguls and i just remember looking at you we're screaming at each other. You got this. You got this. Keep going. Don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. And, and, it, and it, it was like empty bump run. Like, you, I mean, there wasn't like mid, midweek. No one's there. And we're literally screaming at each other to just keep skiing bumps. And you got to keep going. You got it. That's so funny. <laughs> totally. I loved it. That's Love awesome. It. Yeah. Well, yeah. And that's, so I get kind of introduced to the, the race thing with you and, you introduced me to some of that. And I, I of course kind of have this similar, I didn't really have an Olympic dream like you did, but I was sort of like, <laughs> you know, I was like, wait, you can make like a, a U.S. team. I was like, this is crazy. But then that kind of led, you know, back, you remember back then you had to race in races with the lowest FIS point holders. And, yeah. uh, and so most of the team was up in Whitefish, Montana and then it ends up being like we have to dr- they never left so we had to like drive there to race these <laughs> races and uh yeah so i mean i guess yeah, like Lori Stoller, who's still around i see her at snowbird um i think is Lori's i think she might still be on tellies she may have switched to alpine but she was a huge imp- inspiration back then and she knew dana she actually was a east coast girl and you know, racer, but there was a little posse here in Utah. And then of course the free ski scene, like, you know, I went to snowbird and there was a posse of telemark skiers, you know, um, my boyfriend now, Jason stone, he was someone that I followed way back then. We went different ways and, um, reconnected, but this just core group of guys that tell you, and I'm like, Sarah, if you want to get good, you're going to follow these guys down the mountain. Yep. <laughs> and I just did everything in my power to keep up with them. And, you know, it just pushed, pushed me and pushed myself to become what I did with telemark, which was, you know, dream, a dream come true. Yeah, no. And, and cause the race thing only lasted, I think a couple of years for both of us. I mean, you, you, you had probably stopped racing even what, like a year or two after that, like 2002 yeah. ish. Yeah, kind of when the free ski scene um, exploded, because that was more of what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and that's when there was like a, the Jackson Hole comp was amazing. The Berthed, I don't know if you remember, went to the Berthed um, Pass competition. There was a Crested Butte competition, but there were a group of, I mean, there was this all these posses from different locations, you know, that would show up at these competitions and it was just such a fun time, you know? Yeah, no. And, and yeah, you definitely took off with that. Um, I, yeah. So let's kind of hop into that. I mean, do you remember, I mean, you did Brighton in 99 is you kind of started doing the free ski comps in those first couple years, like 2000 to 2002. And then yeah, I mentioned Jeff, Wright Cause USTSA United States telemark ski association primarily was like the race folks it was like the race organization but then they had 
a free ski component during that era. So there was like a full on tour. I mean, it was like five stops. Like you said, Jackson hole, Berthoud pass, uh, us extremes in Crested Butte. I'm trying to think there was an a basin one. And then, um, Oh, I always forget the name of the one in, in California that they would always do at, um, Alpine Meadows, maybe Alpine Meadows. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. So did, so did you kind of hop on that whole circuit right off the bat and start doing all those? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Walk, walk us through a little bit of that. I was, uh, funny enough, Andy Jacobson, another powder horror, uh, was it, yes. he came to the shop for the first time the other day and we were kind of, you know, uh, waxing poetic on old times. And I was, you know, I, I want to hear kind of what your, th- your memories are of that is like, what did it look like? Like, what did the field of competitors look like? Um, I don't know. Like what, what are the the things that stand out? Well, speaking of Andy Jacobson, who I love and adore, he, we actually took my dad's camper to Bertha pass. Um, his girlfriend at the time, Addie, um, had such a good time. I think that's when I met Ross Richards out there. And then like Matt Ross was running it. He linked me up with a photographer in Vail afterwards. I mean, it was just, what I loved about the whole scene is that everybody kind of was supporting each other. We're all, we were all very competitive. We wanted to do the best we could, but everyone was like rooting for each other, which was, I think, the attraction to that whole scene, um, you know, just because everybody's supporting each other and, and then just having a blast. Like just, you know, after parties and a little wild. Like I remember, you know, even just the race scene, you and I up in Whitefish, we had a fun time. <laughs> we, <laughs> played, we played hard and we worked hard. Totally. You know? Yeah. So. Well, would it, the level of skiing back then in those comps, like that's what always stands out to me because, you know, I mean, we're in 2022, a lot of time's gone by. I mean, we're talking 20 years ago. And I still look at footage from those competitions and, you know, we're naming a lot of people, but I mean, you know, in some, in, in, I've seen some really good competitive skiing. There's not any comps currently going on that are telemark specific, but like that era, especially, I mean, people were pushing it. I mean, it was, it was high level. I mean, there was really it was very high level. Yes. Like who, who, yeah. Yeah, I guess like what, take me through a typical run like that you kind of remember. I know it's a long time ago, but like what, like what was required to get on the podium back then? So as a female, um, it was a bit different than the males. Like the male field was insane. Like BJ Brewer was always at the top and I, I was fortunate to be able to go on some trips with him. Um, Molly Duma, you know, competitor in the female um, ben Dolan's, um, you know, and it was fun because there was this mesh of like, you know, I guess at the time considered older than middle and then younger crew coming in. And it was pretty diverse, which made it exciting as well. But as a female, like my goal was always to find something that I could launch and stick because not very many women skis left the ground. And I vaguely recall, I think my second competition would have been a basin. And that's when I met Leslie Ross. I don't know that she came to the Brighton comp, but she must have, but I can't remember. Um, But someone had mentioned, you know, all the girls basically just ski and they win. And I'm like, Oh, okay. (laughs) You know, me being competitive and athlete my whole life. I'm like, you know, I'm going to take it to the next level and just kind of, wanted to try some of the stuff that the guys would do. Um, And so I, you know, I would try and make the run. I'm definitely a fall line kind of girl. Like I like to ski fall line. So picking a line that incorporated some drops and a clean fall line ski was kind of what I would always look for. Depending on the venue, you know, you have your challenges, but um I remember Birth of Pass being one of the really exciting ones because I ended up winning it. And there was a huge party at Breckenridge after. And um, um, 
and my girlfriend Addie, Andy Jacobson's girlfriend at the time, at the bottom was just like screaming with excitement after my run, which was like super emotional for me, like to have that support from a competitor, you know, was super cool. So, um, and I don't even remember what I skied, but I know I nailed it, you know? <laughs> totally. Yeah. So, that's awesome. I, and I, yeah, I just, I, I need to track down like old videos somehow of that stuff because for anyone who hasn't seen those comps and actually funny, Andy Jacobson was bringing up Bertha because I, I kind of asked him about it and he's like, he's like, I remember, and it must've been this trip you went with him because he's like, he, he, he remembers getting there and he was, so if Bertha passed for those that don't know is a defunct ski area kind of on the way to winter <laughs> park. So yes. But, and it had already closed at that point, but it, it, the way he said it to me is like, he's like, I remember getting there and I couldn't believe they were like letting us ski this because they basically like made everyone hike the, hike the venue, I guess, to get to the oh, top. Totally. So it was yes. like full back country, full back country. And exposed, completely exposed. <laughs> yeah. It, it sounded pretty epic. And, uh, yeah. And, and the field of competitors was, it was big too. I mean, um, it's probably hard for people to imagine how many people were participating in these things. I mean, it was a deep field. And like, I think you pointed out greatly, like these different crews, I mean, we're sort of like at the early, most of us like just barely got a cell phone, you know what I mean? So it's not like, you know, people are finding out about stuff through like flyers or, word of mouth or whatever. And then kind of all these crews from different areas would sort of converge on these competitions. And, you know, from what I remember, it was kind of a cool time because you could see different styles and different approaches to things that maybe you weren't seeing with your local crew. And I, for me, that just is always exciting to think back to that time period because of that. Totally. I mean, and, and there, it was, it was big. I mean, it was a big party. There were a lot of people. It wasn't a small event, small venue. I mean, Jackson Hole was even, you know, massive. It was just, it was a lot of fun. And there's so many names that are popping in my head right now of people along the way. And just, I mean, the New Mexico crew to, you know, there were Bozeman people. Um, in the race scene, I don't want to forget, like, Jimmy Lovelo. Like, he he really took my skiing to a next level. I know he did camps up at Mount hood and a lot of us competitors who have been winning these comps went up to that, that camp. And, um, one summer, and I remember him helping me widen my stance with telemark skiing, which changed it significantly with just my aggressiveness, getting those edges in, you know, cause he has a race background and it, it definitely helped me improve my turns that's amazing yeah jimmy ludlow shout out to him <laughs> yes, for a lot sure. a lot of those old wasatch telemark folks like like uh laurie Stoller and and uh yeah. jimmy yeah that's cool um, i ran into grayson grayson I, he's yelled my name you know cruising by from alta past snowbird <laughs> what's Gr- grace i don't know if i know grayson grayson he he was kind of part of that crew too i don't know there's so many people and like you know um they were a little older than us. That's why I'm like the diversity. We were kind of in a, a middle ground that was fun because I got to see some younger folk come in. And then, you know, as you and I have discussed, it kind of everything kind of fell away. But um, just such a diverse, fun group of people. Yeah, no, for sure. Well, okay. So we kind of... I love this. There's so much good (laughs) stuff. No, I love it. This is, it's meaty. There's so much good stuff in here. Um, Well, so like, and you know, even in this like 2000 to 2002, I mean, you and I might've only even worked at Beaver one year, like that very first year. Cause I was only there two seasons and I feel like you might've even left or you had really got into the free ski thing. But you know, I know you, you, probably kind of picked up some notoriety in those comps and you you're starting to kind of get a taste for getting some free equipment and stuff but walk me through like when you realized you could get sponsored and kind of like how that all started because 
from what I remember, it was pretty fast. Like I meet you, you've got the funky outfit on and I'm like, what, what is this race? <laughs> jacket? Leisure suit. <laughs> right. And then like the next thing I know, I'm like, you're like the biggest thing in telemark. And I'm like, I'm like, Sarah, what, like, how did that all happen? Like what, what happened? It's a crazy ride it, it, and it went extremely fast. So, and, and I have a hard time sometimes remembering and piecing the timelines together, but yeah, the comp definitely helped. I won, I won some things in terms of like, they had raffles. So I think I won a gift certificate for, um, some Garmont boots, um, different things like that. Like, you know, and I, I'm like growing up used to hand me downs. I will make whatever work. And um, to get new gear was like such a treat for me. Um, and then, you know, I think Tough Guy Productions, I, I think Nat was working toward that at that point. Um, and then Josh Murphy Bones, you know, he had Unparalleled going. Um, and they were always looking for a female that could fill a segment in a movie and just struggled. You know, they had pieces of different girls doing telemark turns. Um, and let me, let me jump back just slightly. So after Beaver, I came down to Salt Lake. Um, I think I had worked at Ultimate Mountain Outfitters at Snowbird one season, literally approached Rick May asked them if they would sponsor me. I had no photos. I said, I, I'm on the U S team. I want a comp or two or whatever. Um, showed him a, he's like, well, let me see your portfolio. And I like put together some stuff. And all I had was like fly fishing photos. And, <laughs> photos <of myself>. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, and Rick me, I'm just like, what a, a cool guy to like take a shot at someone, but they didn't have anybody on their team that telemark speed. So I was sponsored by, Snowbird was my first sponsor. They sponsored me for 10, 10 years. And, um, and I think I'm trying to remember. So I was working and I worked multiple jobs too. Like, you know, at the same time, like I was working at Cicero's up in park city, um, during the Olympics. And then that summer I decided I wanted to go down to South America and have an endless, endless winter. And so, I went down there um, with Charlie Cannon. I don't know if you remember that name. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we went our separate ways. And that was after, oh, it's hard, Josh. And I, I've been anticipating this this conversation with you. And I'm like, I need to get the timelines right. It's all good. That's, um, that's why we're talking through it because none of, none of us <laughs> remember. And it's like, I'm like, maybe if we record it, we'll figure it out over the course of like 10 conversations. <laughs> Totally, totally. And I remember calling Rosignal on my way down there because at the time I was managing some apartments, working at Cicero's at night, and um, some atomic rep came to apply for the apartments. And um, I hooked him up. He hooked me up. He gave me a huge fat pair of skis because I was on 210 Black Diamond Boundaries. That's what I was telemark skiing on. Oh, yeah. And I met these guys, you know, this posse at Snowbird, and they're all on these huge skis. They're like, you need to get a new pair of skis. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I was stoked. They were called the Heli Star. They didn't make very many of them. I think they were 125, one, no, one, I think they were 135, 115, 125. Um, and I took those down to South America, and then also Rosignol sent me a pair to take down, which weren't as big, like Atomic at the time were making the big skis. Yeah, you, and I then, think they, um, they sent you like Mega Bangs probably. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm trying to think if I had been to Bella Coola by that point yet. I, um, I, think, that's, I think that's just after that. I think that's yeah. like 2003-ish. Yes, yes. So... I don't know how, but while I'm down in South America, no phone, literally sold a guitar um, and my car and had $700 to my name and was going to try and survive down there all winter long with $700. And <laughs> not only I didn't have a return ticket from Chile, I was going to somehow 
make my way to Costa Rica <laughs> and then come home. And that's a whole other adventure and story, but I get this email from outside magazine and they're like, we want to do an article on you. Uh, uh, like you're, we, we've chosen you as one of the top 25 ath athletes under 25 to be featured in, in our magazine. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> totally shocked. Um, and I can't remember the gentleman's name. He's well known. And he, I mean, he'd worked for outside for a long time. And so, um, we talked, we decided that, you know, I would, I would interview with them when I got back to the States, like he was going to fly down there and meet with me and do a photo shoot down there. And, um, it turned out being that they ended up using photos from unparalleled. So that's how it happened. It was kind of over the course of time. So this magazine article came out in December, 2020 or 2000. And, um, let me double check here. I think it's like 2002. Um, but I had no idea what I was, I mean, the, the athletes in the article are like the, the iron brothers, like Andy iron, Bodie Miller, Michael Phelps, <laughs> like I'm, I'm featured with these other athletes. I just felt kind of unworthy, but it's, you know, they were grabbing athletes from different, um, different sports different influences and i loved that they chose to feature telemark as as part of that you know um so felt very honored to be in that and i think that's what really helped launch my sponsorship like being featured in a magazine like outside with all the other athletes um ben dolans had already been sponsored by Nike. And I know they were looking for a female to really launch their ACG, um, line. And they felt like skiing was that, that Avenue. And I don't know what Ben has told you about Nike. He's, he was with them a lot, you know, before. And I, I think they kind of fizzled out the ACG scene, but, um, yeah, I just, it was, it was kind of, it all happened so fast and I was, I'm, I've always kind of been a yes person. And so I'm like, and I remember when, um, so back, um, so after I came home from Europe, I think that following winter is when Josh approached me and said, we'd really like you to come up to Bella Coola with us. And so that was the first film I was in first time, heli skiing, first time kind of exposed to that, um, with Henrik Holland, Frodo Grimvold. Lorenzo Worcester, BJ Brewer, Ben Dolans was there. I think that was the the crew. I don't think I'm missing anybody. We flew into Vancouver, drove the 10 and a half hours up to Bella Coola, and then like some of the best skiing of my life right out of the gate, you know, after coming home from um, Chile. And then from there, after having the film, and that's where I met Beth Lockhart was on that trip. And Beth, Beth and is a, I, I'm going to just fill in, I'm going to fill in quick little gaps because so Beth yeah, Lockhart, thank you. No, 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 <laughs> this is perfect because I just want to point out how um, you mentioned Nike ACG just for those, I, I want to, this is a key point that I tried to point out with Ben and, and you is so Nike ACG, like she said, was sort of like a line of Nike um, that was sort of outerwear specific and uh, ben Dolans had gotten sponsored by him and then you do i mean just uh, just congratulations number one because i mean that was i remember everyone we're all sitting there going nike sponsored telemark skiers like we're just, it's just this like mind i mean i know it was mind-blowing to you but i think everyone on the outside was like wow like how did the what is this you know like nike's involved with telemark this it was kind of crazy right and it gave you that platform that was so much wider, you know, and then, um, that was amazing. So, um, but then you incredible. Yeah. And you mentioned bones and I think bones is someone I'd love to see if I can ever talk him into doing the podcast, but yeah. So you end up shooting in Bella Coola for unpar what would be unparalleled three, which was his series of movies. And that lineup that you mentioned, 
BJ Brewer, Frodo Gromwald, Henrik Holland, uh, uh, is it Holland? Um, Yes. um, Yes. And, uh, Lorenzo. Oh yeah. Lorenzo Worcester. I mean Mm -hmm. that lineup, I, I, I always have that Beth and Beth Lockhart was a photographer. I, that honestly to this day is one of my favorite photos where you guys are all lined up against this old cabin with all your skis and uh, <laughs> if people haven't ever watched that segment, I don't even think it's online. You can maybe track a DVD down. But like you said, I mean, the skiing in that movie is all time. Big mountain skiing. I mean, it was crazy. So, all right. I, f- I filled in the well, gaps. And that was Josh's, yeah. And that was Josh's goal. Like he really wanted, I mean, he, he's still in film. Like he bones is passionate about filming. He was passionate about telemark skiing and, I felt fortunate to make that film because it was, it was his last one, you know? He had, he had one more later, but it was called the lost season. There was like a couple year gap. Oh, that's right. You would remember. (laughs) I know I'm a nerd. I'm a total nerd. No, I love it. Love it. Love it. But yeah, so that was my first exposure into the film world, into heli skiing. And I remember, I vividly remember this. They, we kind of flew up. We all did one little, you know, chill run together. The guide was super cool. Um, just such a spectacular lodge. Anyone who's been up to the Santa Lodge, like it's unbelievable. And the Bella Coola is still one of my favorite places I've ever skied. Um, but then they're like, okay, you know, and again, here I am just very naive along for the ride. Um, definitely had the personality and the determination and the confidence to succeed, but they go to drop me off on my line. Okay, sir, this is the line you're going to ski. And I'm like, okay, I think you're trying to memorize this. I mean, back then it would take Polaroids. I didn't have a Polaroid. I had to try and memorize it in my head. (laughs) Wow. And the the heli kind of hovers is looking for an LZ landing zone is what LZ is. And, uh, couldn't really land where they were going to drop me. So he was hovering and they're like, okay, Sarah, get out here. We'll give you a countdown. You have your radio, you know? And so they had to like drop, drop me. Like I had to like jump and then they kind of handed me my skis and then they took off. And I remember just hugging my skis for a solid 15 minutes. Like, holy, what am I going to do? Like, how am I going to make it? You know, like I'm here alone and in, this is springtime. So I'm hearing like, um, slides, big slides all around me. And I'm like, Oh my God, I'm going to (laughs) die. And then I talk myself like, okay, you got this, you got this, you know, it's kind of, you go through this self doubt and then you're like, you got this Sarah. And there was this one, it's hard to gauge how big these cliffs are. But there was this one feature in the line that I was going to ski that I knew I wanted to hit. Like, this is my first debut in a film. Um, Josh had already expressed to me how important it is to ski. Like, this is film. Film's expensive. It's not like the day and age now where it's, you know, digital. We can delete, splice, you know, edit. Um, So I I knew I had to nail this. So I, I... and I couldn't see anything. It's blind. Like it rolled over and I wouldn't be able to see anything until I dropped in. So, you know, a couple of the guys ski, I'm listening on the radio and they're okay, Sarah, it's your turn. And at that time, I believe Henrik was down at the bottom because they dropped this off on this kind of peak bowl to where we all had a line to ski, you know, maximizing budget. Right. And, um, and so a couple guys were already down at the bottom and Henrik was one of them. And I remember that vividly because of the comment he made when I get to the bottom. But so I roll over, I see the feature, I make a turn and, and they do, um, Beth did take pictures of it to where there's a, a pretty sweet shot that I think was in um, Black Diamond. And I mean, it was far away because the Barbie was a ways away, but, I take a turn, I hit it kind of sideways and stick it. And just the snow was incredible. That run today is still my favorite run. And I get to the bottom and Henrik is like, I have never seen, you know, anyone ski a line, like, like a female ski a line like that in my life. 
and just everyone was, we were all pumped, stoked. I mean, cause you're out in the elements, like this is, it could be life threatening out there. And so you've got to have each other's back and support each other. So it was pretty spectacular, but that kind of launched everything. And, um, from there, you know, just, uh, just to jump forward to when Nike, I get a call from Nike. I knew they were interested. I knew they were looking at a few different girls. Um, and I had just got asked to, you know, being sponsored by Snowbird, they did this competition against Jackson Hole where they, we, we competed to see how many tram runs we could get in, in a day. And there was a team of four in Jackson, which I think consisted of, um, oh, Josh, you might need to help me. Who's the head telly guy in Jackson? He's still around. Head t- um, I'm trying to think who that would have been. I'm blanking. I know. I need to find out. But he was on the team. Um, oh, my goodness. We would have to look that up. But um, it was a pretty strong team in Jackson. Were, were, they, our- were they doing their tram and you guys were doing Snowbird's yeah. tram? Oh, <laughs> yes. crazy. Okay. Yes. And so on our team, it was Shannon Yates, who was a snowboarder. Um, Nora Pinkus, who was an alpine skier, Kasha Rigby, who was telemark at the time, and myself. And then it was, uh, oh, Car- Carhill, I think it's Lindsay Dyer's, uh, there was a female, and then three oh, Car- males, Tommy. Car- Car- Cargill, yeah. Yes, and then, go ahead. No, 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 yeah. I think she actually has the first um, telemark descent, women's telemark descent on the T- Grand Teton, if I remember right. But anyways, that's go, insane. Yeah, no, go ahead. But yeah, so keep going. And then, and then, and I, I, I love this guy. I can't, I don't know why I can't think of his name, but, and then there was, um, I think it was Johnny Mosley as well, but they had a strong team and we had, you know, our team, but we were all females and then it was three males and a female there. Um, and they were kind of like, oh, you guys have to use your train. They, you know, groom chips, but we ended up winning. It was how many vertical feet you could get in and, I actually, so we did 30 trams. <laughs> wow. Like, co- so as a group, not like rotating through people, it was like the group went up and the group went down. The group. Oh, yes. geez. Okay. It, it was insane. It was so much fun. And when Dave Fields asked me to do it and he's still up at Snowbird and just a remarkable person, um, I remember thinking, absolutely, yes. And then started thinking, oh, my God, how am I going to do that? (laughs) I'm not in shape. I think this was like, I want to say it was in January as well. So I wasn't like in ski shape. And I know, you know, back then we tried to do some dry land training, but you're never in shape for skiing until you start skiing. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) Especially 30 tram laps. Jeez. (laughs) Yeah. So it was it was amazing. So w- end of the day, we got 30 trams in, um, which I think was like 86,000 vertical feet. I did personally that day. Um, I think as a total, it was something else. And I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not accurate with my numbers, but, um, so we get to the bottom, we're all partying, super stoked celebrating. And then like I get a phone call, and at the time, I did have a cell phone, and it's Christy Farron from Nike. And like, at while we're celebrating, and I answer, and I'm like, "Hi, Christy." And like, she's like, "Sarah, we want to fly you up, you know, to Portland, and we want to sign you with Nike. And um, you know, can we book book you a ticket in the next day or two? And I was like, "What?" So like, all this happened so quick, so fast. Flew up there. They wanted me to sign a four-year contract, which at the time I was like an idiot to be nervous about. (laughs) I don't know if I want to sign with you for four years. That's a long time. (laughs) And she kind of looked at me and she's like, just sign it. (laughs) (laughs) And and so I signed the contract and yeah, that's kind of where it all started. Well, what that's amazing. First off, um, in, in a four year contract's legit. I mean, I, I think the thing back then too is, you know, I, I would assume that that's, 
I always try to explain sponsorship to people because in telemark, as you know, there's been even, I mean, this is the heyday. I mean, early 2000s, I mean, there was companies that were getting behind telemark skiers. It was a different landscape completely in terms of product. Um, but I always say like Absolutely. S- sponsorship, the easiest way I've always tried to explain it to people is at, at, at very least the sponsorships to help alleviate your cost, right? Like a painter, if you were to give them canvas and paints and allow them not to have to work to pay for those things, then they have more time to actually paint. Right. And a skier is the same way. It's like, you know, it, it, a lot of us were just trying to get, Oh, can I get like a little travel budget and can you cover my boots, skis and bindings and outerwear, you know? But I remember, absolutely. Yeah. I I remember thinking like your Nike contract must've been, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed like it was, it was a legitimate enough contract that like, you know, you had a base living, you know, like you were, you had enough of a base to not have to work or work as much, I would think. And um, that, that freed you up to ski and actually focus on the craft, you know, I mean, is that kind of how you felt about it? I mean, getting into it with a company that large. Absolutely. Like a, a salary and a small salary for them, but still nonetheless, a salary. And, and part of it too, um, was the ability to have an influence and to be a part of Nike, like the campus and they, they cared about our input and our thoughts and what we thought, you know, outerwear should be. They really wanted our advice. And it was just, I mean, it was a dream come true, Josh, like to be a part of something like that. And so, and Nike, I mean, they have some of the best athletes in the world. And, you know, so when we would fly up there, they would put us in the same spot where they put all these other athletes. <laughs> like the hotels I would get to stay in and being the only female, like I ha- always had my own room, which had like two bathrooms. <laughs> like It was insane. Like I just felt so spoiled. It was like, yeah, spoiled, but a salary and then a travel budget, which to get, you know, to go and film up in Bella Coola, like I had to go around my little community and try and earn enough money to cover the portion. Like Josh was kind enough. He, he, he was confident enough that I could, you know, succeed in his film that he covered a portion as well. Like we were all just trying to make it work, had a passion, but the budgets were always super tight, you know, for sure. Well, and that must have, I, I would think that that probably, I mean, that once you kind of lock that four-year contract in, it probably helped you sort of leverage some other opportunities with other sponsors to where you could put together, like you said, like a, a living, you know, which, yeah. which historically in Telemark, like there's probably so few cases. I mean, I don't know all the, the details of the cheddar so to speak, with people. But, mm-hmm. you know, I think of like you and Ben must have, you're probably the only two that have legitimately, you know, were making a, a living at Telemark skiing specifically. And and I'm kind of curious, like what, so what, what projects did that lead you into? Because that obviously is going to open up, you know, they, they, they want, they want a good return on their investment. So they're probably pushing you into, uh, not pushing that maybe that's not the right word, but guiding you or suggesting different projects, um, you know, film and photo. Um, once you got in with Nike, like where did that lead to? Like what kind of projects were you able to get involved with from there? So this is, this is the, um, this is kind of the bizarre, but magical moment now that I get to tell you, because here I am and I'm going to take you back where, I was in Bozeman um, and I came down to Logan to go to a Warren Miller film, which everyone loved to go and get pumped up for the season and watch a Warren Miller. That's just kind of what, what you did. And they, they would always feature it at the university. And I remember sitting in my chair and looking up at the film and thinking, you know, and I was so in love. This was my first season telemark skiing up in Bozeman and um, you know, full, first full season and I remember thinking to myself I want to be in that 
I want to be in the Warren Miller. I want to be telemark skiing in a Warren Miller. I had no idea how I was going to make that happen, but just like literally called it out and was determined. And so bounce forward to getting sponsored by Nike. They were a huge sponsor for Warren Miller and, and, Two at the time, like I thought, you know, Warren Miller, oh, they just go and find the best athletes <laughs> in the world. <laughs> Little do you know. <laughs> <laughs> they all, everyone has to make money, right? <laughs> yep. so, yeah, there's a lot of structure behind the scenes with those things people don't realize. Yeah, and, and, and with good reason. I mean, it's expensive to produce, and um, but Nike had the budget to have a foot in the door and was one of Warren Miller's major sponsors. And so, um, after signing with Nike, um, I did go up to Alpine Meadows, entered a competition and, and had no idea yet still that Warren Miller was a possibility. I knew that Ben had been in one. Um, and then, so at Arapaho Basin, I did this cool little line, hit a cliff jump, landed, caught an inside edge, kind of bounced to the side, but bounced back up. So it, it, you know, kind of not really a fall, but so kind of a save. Um, I think I came in second place out of that run, but tweaked something like my knee. And I was like, something's not right. And, and that trip I carpooled with um, Rosenberg, Jacobson, Andy Moeller, like all of us piled into, I don't know if you remember Rosenberg's huge flatbed, like massive diesel oh, oh truck. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I, I knew I did something to my knee. So I go up to do a second run and I'm like, Oh my God, it's not like my knee wasn't working. It wasn't functioning. And so I decided, you know, I'm just going to do a chill run. I'm not going to try and do anything crazy. So I just skied my line, but I knew something was wrong. And so that night, like it swelled up to, like the size of my thigh, you know, like it was massive. And, um, and Andy Rogensenberg's dad is an orthopedic surgeon. Well known. I think he did Tiger Woods knee. He's like, well, you might want to have my dad take a look at it when we get back. And <laughs> so I go in to see Dr. Rosenberg. He's like, yep, it's blown. You know, you blew your ACL. And, um, you know, I suggested we, we, do surgery right away. And at that point, Nike had told me, so, you know, they're like, Sarah, so we are leaving to Morocco in less than a month. And, um, you know, we're going to go ski in Morocco for a Warren Miller film. Literally after I blew my knee and I was, I was devastated. I'm like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I said, surgery is not an option. You need, I need to figure out how I'm going to be able to ski. <laughs> Cause I refuse to be not be in this war and Miller. <laughs> you know, I just signed with Nike and, and at the time I, I, you know, you're hurt, but you want to be tough. You want to show that face. So I didn't tell anybody that I really blew my knee. Um, but you know, my close team mates that we were going on this trip to, I, I just wanted them to know so that they, you know, but I've got myself, I, I can handle myself because Morocco was, intense like we climbed from sea level all the way to i think like i forget um how tall the peak is there but it was like thirteen thousand feet and um so it was it was pretty intense but i was committed and you know trudged along and then after the season came home and had knee surgery which is brutal like injuries and as an athlete are devastating it's like not only physical but mentally so it, it kind of changed things for sure for me but um well, yeah real, real quick so <laughs> that's insane <laughs> so you go <laughs> so you blow your knee you don't tell nike and <laughs> and then you fly to morocco and mm -hmm. which i mean how, how did you even I know you put your game face on, but like, how did you even get, was it just super painful? Like you just kind of made it work to ski? Um, well, so you, so with ACLs and I was so unaware, like, and once you blow one, you know, you, you know what it feels like. 
um, cause I ended up blowing another one a couple years later, my other knee. Um, but you're able to continue to function. It's just you, your muscles, it's almost like you have to train your muscles to be strong enough to hold that knee together. Um, but you know, Dr. Rosenberg, he's like, okay, I get where you're coming from. Let's fit you for a brace. And so, and I hate stuff like that, but I had to wear a brace. Um, and that's where I think I stopped wearing knee pads because the brace wouldn't really fit with my knee pads. And so, yeah, I wore a brace the whole time because if, if I fell or took a blow, it could potentially, um, take out my MCL and my PCL and, you know, the ACL was already gone, but you just have a more, you know, probability to like take out your whole knee. So I was just careful. So I didn't, you know, I definitely didn't ski like I would have wanted to ski in a Warren Miller, but you know, I skied in a Warren Miller. <laughs> yeah, no, that's amazing. What, what was it like in Morocco? Cause I had, I'd probably have to go back and watch it. I feel like there was like a, uh, I, I think I remember watching it. You were like holding a snake or something, or am I making that up in my head? No, for sure. No, Ben, Ben kissed a snake. Okay. I had monkeys were, I think, um, it was Morocco. Like I've been dying to go back there. I loved it. The experience was unbelievable. Um, it's just so rich with culture and life and it's beautiful it's beautiful and peaceful there's like there were prayers going off every i don't know how often but it seemed multiple times a day our guide would get down and pray he was super cool it was just the whole experience was like small town mendon little girl <laughs> like going to morocco it was pretty wild and uh you know always being a female in this world you know of men like morocco was fully that like I was at any restaurant we went to, it was interesting. I was served last. <laughs> oh, jeez! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. I, like I noticed all these little intricacies and it really helped me. I have some OCD <laughs> issues with cleanliness and stuff. I don't know. And, and Morocco like helped <laughs> buffer those to where, I mean, just their toilet situation, um, you know, just the whole thing. It was, it was eye opening and, and I grew tremendously on that trip. That's amazing. And actually, you know, Brad Ludden, who phenomenal kayaker, also Nike athlete, you know, um, we kayaked in the ocean. It was kind of the whole trip was, you know, mountains to sea, which was super cool. Yeah. I can't, I mean, when you, when you hear Morocco, that's probably, I'm, I'm sure there's people listening and thinking like there's skiing there, <laughs> you know, like, you, wouldn't, yeah. you know, it, it, people probably wouldn't even associate it with that. But I think that's, you know, Warren Miller, I think has done a good job, um, over the course, you know, that body of work, it's always so interesting because they find these like weird, unique places where there's snow and, and then, you know, obviously Warren Miller was like the king of storytelling within that, you know, and, um, I, I, yeah, I just, I think, I think that must've been an, an amazing experience. And I wanted to hit on this too. You mentioned it in Bella Coola, but if you could hit on a little bit of like shooting film, both mm -hmm. on, um, you know, bones was shooting 16 millimeter, uh, Warren Miller, I think was primarily 16 millimeter as well. And then, you know, most of these photographers during this time are still all shooting film as well. Like, I mean, what, yeah, you kind of talked about just the expense of it. I think people know in general, but how did that affect your skiing a little bit? Because I think, you know, in an era where we walk around with an iPhone that shoots 4k, I mean, it's a little bit different, you know, putting a, a reel on Instagram versus like back then, I mean, what were some of the things sort of throughout these film projects you're doing where you're shooting film that maybe influenced your style or like things that people gave you tips on or things that you thought of that, you know, were a little more associated with that medium? Yeah. So, I mean, being on the same page and being able to listen and collaborate with the photographer, which by the way, like what photographers do cinematographers, all of it, they are full on badasses, like incredible. The gear that they haul and, and the shots they have to get. I mean, the athlete, like being the star is one thing, but 
they're they're beyond athletes in their own way for sure and and um for them to capture that perfect shot you know it's great communication timing um and a lot of patience a lot of patience and i think you know at the end of my career per se I, not that I ran out of patience, but I just wanted to ski for me, you know, um, towards the end and just having the best of the best out of the gate. And then it just, it, to match what I had, you know, it was this, this window of glory, really. Um, but yeah, just a lot of patience and communication. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, I mean, you put a, you put a lot of time in and I think that is a different, I think you kind of hit on it, you know, uh, when you're working as a, as a skier, it's different than being a skier a lot of times, you know, in terms of, um, you know, there's deliverables, right? Like, especially if you have a, a, a contract or multiple contracts, like, you know, it's putting a segment together, it's getting that exposure and stuff. And so it sounds like, you know, and I, I think probably, uh, through that contract, I mean, by the end, when you kind of got done with Nike, I mean, kind of, it, it sounds like you just kind of wanted to start skiing for yourself. I mean, is that kind of, kind of the, tra- kind of the trajectory that kind of took you out of that? Yeah. So, well, so, um, my contract was coming to an end. Christy Fair no longer worked with that department. Um, they were kind of going a different direction as well. So I knew I needed to either look for a new sponsorship um, and, and part of it too, like having their budget, I had a whole budget for my salary and, and I had, you know, I could expense things. It was tricky because I, I also was on the other end where, you know, I started working with Stefan who took over Tough Guy Productions and we would do some trips up to Valdez, but most of the other telemark skiers could only afford you know, luckily the lodge up there, um, um, oh, I don't know why it's drawing, I'm drawing a blank, but you know, in Valdez, like there's the two main lodges, but they had this program where they would do a heli drop for a hundred bucks per person, which was affordable for, you know, and, and everyone worked so hard to, to be at that point. We'd live in an RV, um, you know, you really had to have each other's back and trust each other. You're in life threatening situations. Um, but you know, so it was easy for me to go on those trips because of my accessibility to my budget, but you know, not for everybody else. So sometimes that was hard to, to match up with what the industry was doing, if that makes sense. Um, but when that came to a halt, I actually, I'm not, I, I didn't feel like I was very good at selling myself in terms of sponsorship. So I looked into getting um, um, an agent and I found this female agent who mainly primarily worked with traditional sports and she was out of Vegas and I asked her to, you know, be my agent. Um, I had a great resume background and she didn't know much about the ski industry but it was extremely challenging and i think a lot of people you know especially (laughs) from that industry get a call from an agent for a telemark skier female they're like yeah (laughs) bye-bye that's that's like really forward thinking too because like you think this is probably like what 2005 or something like that 2006 (laughs) Yes. yes yeah i mean so yeah, I guess. Yeah. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. I, I didn't know you had an agent. That's kind of an interesting, that's an interesting transition because I mean, I, I hear about that in certain things now, like even climbing or, you know, sports that we traditionally probably wouldn't associate athletes with like sports agents. And I think, yeah, there is a challenge because the numbers are so different, you know, like it's not, yeah. <laughs> this isn't like the NBA or something, you know, it's like, you know, not in the grand scheme of things, the numbers of snow sports enthusiasts are uh, much smaller. <laughs> There's a little yeah, less totally. money pouring through the door. Totally. And she was a sweetheart. Like, and again, I, I'm horrible with names, Josh. So I'd have to go back and it would come to me eventually. But she, I remember meeting her in Vegas. We went to the 
the different shows um, to meet with people. We were pursuing Patagonia at the time and they just weren't interested because North Face had their team. You know, they had Kasha and Hillary, which are such amazing females in the industry. And so it was, we were limited. There, there weren't too many options to explore that had that kind of budget that Nike did, right? Yeah. And when you're building something, you tend to want to progress, not digress. So... And I just, you know, again, me being me, like, wanted to focus on what I loved, my passion, and being out there selling myself was not part of that. Yeah. So, you did pretty, yeah, so you we, did pretty good, though. Uh, I'll, I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure I'm sure listeners are like, well, you kind of, for someone who doesn't like to sell herself, you, you did pretty good all the way back to your high school uh biology class or whatever you got out of to, or chemistry to go ski in so <laughs> totally totally and nike was so it was just you know it was remarkable i got to be in another film with them as well which was um up in alaska in the Wrangell saint elias which was totally yeah it, i don't know i mean i think a lot of the listeners probably know where the Wrangells are but it's you were on your game in that in that hood you know with crevasses and it was the closest to Everest feeling that I've, you know, you're out in the middle of nowhere, you know? So, um, but that was fun, but yeah, no, it was, it was an interesting ride for sure. And I don't like, I, I loved it all the way along the way. I still hang on and I'm still skiing. I'm still very passionate about it. Some people have been in it for a long time. You have created something extraordinary with your passion for it. Um, you know, and now I'm a, a mom taking my kiddos up, you know, as much as possible and, you know, still love skiing as much as I can. <laughs> no, I love that. And, 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 you know, once you transitioned out of skiing, I mean, you ended up starting your own business too. Uh, maybe, maybe we can kind of wrap on that too. Cause I, what, that's something I've always admired about you too, is, is, you know, you are a go getter, you know, maybe you don't want to be out selling yourself for, for a skiing, but <laughs> you did have an, an amazing telemark career like um and and it's rad hearing the stories because like it's insane to think like in that short, i mean you're talking like from the time you really picked up telemark to that that career trajectory i mean you're talking maybe eight years max or something like that i mean you did some bad yeah. you did some badass stuff but yeah um, but yeah, t t I guess, yeah, what are you up to these days? I know you got two little ones that are rippers at Snowbird and um, and you got, and you've got a, a thriving business too. Yeah, so I actually started Garden Girls is the business and I started it in 2002 that summer. Um, you know, even though I had my Nike, like I wasn't just gonna, like I had, I, I like being busy and I have always been super passionate about the outdoors and plants and um, took some courses in horticulture, I huge I love biology, I always have, and started a company called Garden Girls with one of my close um, girlfriends that I grew up with. Um, and she ended up not really digging it. <laughs> 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 and kind of peeled out mid season and um you know just that first season of being out there gardening for clients and it was primarily maintenance at the time um my business grew like i needed to hire other employees and so um it just grew from that summer to to now to where we do full you know landscape architectural drawings and implementations i'm a gc so i can basically do anything and and a long old dream would be to incorporate an actual the home the whole architecture of the home into the landscape because i think landscapes are always um you know the aftermath or what do we have budget for uh, i deal with it on a daily basis working with people's budgets and i think it really should be created when you're building or even creating the architecture of your home you know um so that would be a long goal dream uh or a, yeah and but i do all sorts of stuff with landscaping you know implementing old 
with new um and it, yeah it all it all has its challenges but it's been so fun i'm still very passionate about it um it's my creative outlet and sometimes i surprise myself i go to have you know consults and and to start geeking out on plants and my knowledge of plants and i push the limits in that arena as well like getting things to grow that normally people don't see you know in utah and and it's it's super fun i love it that's amazing 20 years well yes that's amazing i I remember when you started that and i that's amazing congratulations because that is no small feat i mean to make it a couple years is one thing to make it 20 years and uh still be doing it and, and doing even more than you were doing in the beginning is is incredible so i love that yeah it's been fun thank you yeah that's amazing well i uh i'm looking forward we're, we're gonna re we're gonna reconnect on the snow and uh we're gonna we better no i know i'm ex- i'm excited so um well thanks for walking us through your amazing journey i I, I, I seriously, I can't thank you enough. I mean, you, uh, you definitely helped me find a a fun trajectory way back then too. And, uh, we didn't touch on it, but I told you the other day, you took me out with Beth Lockhart to shoot photos for the first time and taught me that I could get free skis if I got sponsored. And I thought that was the coolest (laughs) thing ever. I still have a photo of those first pair of Carhu skis that Ted McGinnis sent me sitting when I was literally sleeping on a floor on an air mattress. And I took a picture of my boots and my skis in the corner. Cause I thought that was so amazing. So, and here, yeah, and here we are sure. all these years later. So it's, it's cool. You know, I think crossing paths with, with each other was, was a really uh, rad thing. And it's cool to see where it's taken both of us. Absolutely. And our friendship, you know, just long lasting, even though we've gone our separate ways and, but to reconnect is like, you know, we didn't skip a beat. Not even close. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been so fun, Josh. And I love, I've been excited. We could talk for hours, but I'm sure <laughs> it is, you know, I, I'm sure you have limits with your podcast, but we definitely need to reconnect and yeah, go play on the snow and have dinner and all that fun stuff. I love it. Well, let's do it soon. And uh, thanks for coming on the pod. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Okay. Talk to you later. Okay. Bye. Bye. Well, another fine, fine conversation and one that I have waited so long to have. I'm so grateful Sarah took the time out of her busy schedule to sit down and talk to me about her career everything that kind of went down during that time. And I'm just uh, so grateful for all these amazing people I've been able to meet along my telemark journey. And she's one of them. And one of those standouts where, uh, you know, she came in, she had an amazing career. She did some really rad stuff. And, uh, and then she moved kind of into the next phase of life. And uh, I've always respected her skiing. And it's fun to reminisce a little bit about uh, skiing together back at, at uh, Beaver Mountain. I still remember those days of skiing mogul lines, screaming at each other and uh, pushing each other to try to be better. And uh, that's what uh, what I've always appreciated about her. So I hope you all enjoyed the podcast out there and got some good little history tidbits. And uh, hopefully you can find uh, maybe uh, Warren Miller's journey, maybe to watch that Morocco segment, which is really good. I still don't think uh, there's any online versions of some of the unparalleled movies, uh, but she she's we, we didn't talk a lot about all the film segments she did, but there's definitely quite a few between the Tough Guy movies, Unparalleled, Warren Miller, and uh, I believe even uh, PWO5 Powder Horror. I'd have to double check, but I'm pretty sure she was in there in that as well. So uh, lots of fun stuff and a great conversation and uh, super psyched to, to finally get her on. So kind of wrapping up the show, uh, please sign up for the mailing list. That's number one. Stay in touch with what we're doing over at Free Hill Life. Uh, when we take that in, I always say, you know, this is, a, this is an email list between us and our customers, and that's, uh, that's how we're going to keep it. Uh, we want you to trust us with your information, and we send out an email at the beginning and end of every week. 
to connect you to what's going on in the retail space, uh, news on new arrivals, new releases, uh, maybe tech videos, content that we just put out and the like. Uh, awesome place to kind of congregate it all on a weekly basis so you don't have to sit there and scroll your phone and, and try to find it all on uh, the social media side of things. Uh, everyone can connect with me if you're interested uh, on finding me on Instagram. I'm at Josh No Madsen, pretty active on there as well as on Facebook uh, at Josh No Madsen. And I'm also in our Facebook group, which is constantly growing. I think we're just shy of about 7,000 people on there and uh, really just trying to kind of get uh, in there and, and talk more, add more to what we're doing with the brand and the retail shop. And it's a great place to connect. But Uh, Those are a couple of places that you can find us there as well as the mailing list, obviously, that I just mentioned. And we're always trying to find ways to to help build our community around our brand and what we're doing. And uh, all of you, obviously, podcast listeners are a huge part of that. So we love that. Uh, If you're looking for anything, we're fully stocked up in the retail shop. Uh, Plenty of volet skis, uh, volet bindings. Uh, in Wild, Majo Bindings, 22 Designs, Outlaw, Axle, Vice, all that good stuff. So, uh, and then the Scarpa boots I talked about in the intro is uh, available, but just depends on size and model. But we're, we'll do our best to put together what you need to keep you going and keep you stoked this season. So, I'll be back next Monday. I hope uh, you'll subscribe to the podcast. If you're an Apple listener, helps a ton. If you rate and review the podcast, always love getting those and sharing them with other uh, potential listeners out there or people that are listening. Uh, And big thank you to all the diehards out there that literally listen every week. So much love and respect for you. That's a lot of episodes to, uh, to, to listen to and kind of digest. But what's been most cool for me is meeting people that identify themselves when they come in retail or email me and, and, uh, you know, say, Hey, I'm a podcast listener. And I I love that because that's such a, a cool way to be able to connect with everyone out there as well. So be sure to, uh, mark world telemark day on your calendars, Saturday, March 4th. Let's rock and roll and uh, get in touch with me at podcast at freehealthlife.com if you need anything until then. And I will see you next Monday with another episode. And until then, spread telemark always.